Good evening, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Jamima Pear. And J Dr. Jamima Pear, um, let me see here, I pulled you up. Dr. Jamima Pear, and now I'm not having seen you. Dr. Jamima, could you introduce yourself to us? Because I'm not seeing what I put up here for you. Could you introduce yourself to us, Dr. Jamima Pear? And yeah. tell us, you know, yeah, I know that you are a professor at the University of, of British Columbia. But um, could you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes. Hi, my name is Jamima Pierre. I'm um, Haitian American, born in Haiti. Yes. Um, I am, uh, grew up in the U.S. I just moved to Canada uh, less than a year ago. So now I'm a professor um, at the University of British Columbia, uh, Vancouver, Canada. I'm a professor of um, race and political economy in at the Institute of Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. I'm also um, the co-coordinator of the Haiti Americas team for the Black Alliance for Peace, which is an anti-imperialist organization in the US. Good, thank you so much for joining and thank you for that great introduction, um, Dr. Pear. Now, Dr. Pear, one of the things that when we talk about Haiti, people tend to look at the whole aspect of history and Haiti is the first black republic and they give us a long history and there's no context. So could you tell us, um, Dr. P Professor Pear, what's the latest with regard to the US led Kenyan military forces to be deployed to Haiti? Is there anything, are, they, are the troops on the ground? They're not troops on the ground. They're U.S. troops on the ground and U.S. contractors on the ground, because, as you know, this deployment is about making money for the military industrial complex um, and, and U.S. soldiers. And so the reality is the U.S. soldiers started, you know, the U.S. started sending um, a, a number of plane loads of equipment and people and personnel into Haiti for about a month now. They've been flying in these um, planes and supposedly our airport is closed, but they have full access to our airspace. They can land. Um, there was a video of a Haitian journalist walking through the airport with the U.S. military officials. Um, so that tells us that the U.S. this is a U.S. Uh, this is a U.S. mission. They're there. I've also seen contracts where they're offering for people to provide the bed, linens, for people to provide Wi-Fi because this is what it, this is about. This is about filling the pockets of, you know, there are no bid contracts to corporations in Canada and the U.S. And so they're um, they're there. They've also, I wanted to say, this has gone under the radar. They've destroyed about 350 um, uh, homes around wow. the airport. Wow. Yeah, and, and that's really, you know, that's moving people away. Um, you know, there's an impoverished population that lives um, in those neighborhoods. And so they've, you know, they say that they pay them compensation, but how do you pay people compensation for destroying their homes? 300 homes, there, there, are few, uh, there are about 100 more that are about to be destroyed around the airport vicinity. Mind you, that airport has been there for a long time. So the fact that they think that they need to create a security corridor by destroying these homes. And so we already know, see the, what, what occupation, uh, 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 an, an enhanced occupation is going to look like. Um, uh, as the Kenyan um, police, uh, we're not sure. Um, you know, they were, they were challenged by Kenyan um, former Supreme Court justice in Kenya and by activists in Kenya working with some activists in the U.S. and Haiti trying to stop this ridiculous deployment. Um, uh, and so now they're still also waiting to be paid because the truth is the Congress has not released a lot of the funds. And Kenya says they're, they can't send their soldiers, uh, their police, until they're, they're paid that, I think, three or four hundred million dollars that the U.S. promised them. So this is, you know, the Kenyan mercenaries, I'm sure, will show up. Right. Um, but this is, a, this is a U.S. invasion. Right. Now, what do you believe is the agenda of this military operation? What's the end game in terms of the ultimate agenda? Yeah, I think one of the things that happens when we talk about Haiti is that people exceptionalize Haiti so much to make it seem like whatever's happening in Haiti is just out of this world because these people are so black and African and voting Correct. practitioners and, and, you know, the racist representation that we see both in the Western media as well as the West Indian media. Absolutely. Um, uh, and so there's this there's a view of these Haitians who just can't get their acts together. And so one of the first things I wanted to say, it, to just back up a little bit to answer your question, is to yes. say, you know, Haiti is under occupation, and Haiti has been under occupation um, formally since 2004. And I don't think people understand that because in 2004, um, 2003, the year before, U.S., France, and Canada met in Ottawa, and people can look up this thing called the Ottawa Initiative. Yes. They met in Ottawa and decided to remove Haiti's elected president. And there were no wow. Haitians in the room. 
Um, um, it was uh, U.S. European representatives, um, OAS representatives. They all decided that they um, and they questioned it. I think Dennis Paridis, who was I think the French, I mean the Canadian, one of the Canadian um, um, uh, uh, people that were at the meeting, basically uh, admitted in a video. Uh, and I can send you that link, admitted in a video that basically they were discussing whether sovereignty was something that was, you know, that that could be contemplated for Haiti. So they were very clear, um, you know, <laughs> about the, the, the thing. So then they, they supported this coup d'etat and the U.S. Marines landed in Aristide's house, put him on a plane and flew him to Africa. Yes. Um, at the time, it was uh, uh, P.J. Patterson that tried yes. to actually stop it, uh, the head of the CARICOM, when CARICOM was actually a bit more you know, left this than it is now. Yes, um, and, yes, and, and, yes. So, and so this is what happened. And then what happened is two members of the UN Security Council, permanent members of the UN Security Council, US and France, were able then to use the UN. They had already drawn up a plan for a military invasion to make it seem like this president resigned when they removed him from office. And so then they were able to consecrate and, 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 and justify this, uh, um, um, coup, they covered up the coup d'etat through a UN military occupation. So then you have the UN uh, Chapter 7 deployment, you know, of thousands of military soldiers. And Chapter 7 deployment is important because it also tells you how brutal they treat Haitians, because Chapter 7 only happens when there's a civil war yeah. in a country. Very few people get a Chapter 7 deployment, which means that you can use full force from by air, sea and, sea, and land on the population. Haiti was, did not have a civil war, but they sent in a Chapter 7 deployment. The UN soldiers, the, the thing about this, though, it was like, um, for UN occupation, it met soldiers from all over the world, which meant that the entire world was participating in the occupation of Haiti after a coup d'etat done by two members of the UN Security Council. So, and then they created the core group, which is a group of uh, uh, yes. um, unelected non-Haitian officials that include Brazil. And I have to be very clear about that. Hey, uh, US, France of all places, Canada, Brazil, um, European Union, World Bank officials that basically make decisions. So when you hear about the core group, that's what's happening. And so even though the UN forces, the majority of them left in 2017, and people say the UN left, there's still a UN office in Haiti Correct. that makes all the decisions. So if you look at the UN, you know, what's going on, whenever there's a meeting about Haiti, it's the UN, it's the core group people that are presenting on Haiti, on Haiti's behalf, not us Haitians. So, mm -hmm. so there's that. So there's an occupation that's been going on for 20 years. And through that occupation, the US was able to actually install presidency. So in 2011, uh, uh, after the U.S. after the earthquake fall of 2010, the U.S. paid for elections in Haiti because they wanted to control the process, mm -hmm. and um, and basically Hillary Clinton flew in and changed the election results. Um, the first wow. thing they did was basically remove um, the the most popular political party, which means that the majority of people did not participate in these elections. Um, and then when they did the elections, their their favorite candidate that they handpicked that did not even have a Haitian passport that they Correct. procured for him a few days before the election, they Hillary Clinton flew in, flew in. He, she was um, uh, Barack Obama's secretary of state, of state yeah. and yeah. demanded that the election result be changed so that they're the ones that put in this political party, which has wreaked havoc on Haiti. So, the, so through this occupation, they've been able to install presidents, um, Martelly, Michel Martelly, and then his uh, uh, his successor that they were installed through bad elect, so-called elections as well, and then um, install a prime minister, uh, the core group installed a prime minister after the assassination of the successor. And now what's happening is they just installed another presidential council and a prime minister, which has not, which completely, there's nothing in our constitution, completely against our constitution. No wow. one has followed the constitution since 20 since 2004, 2004. Mm -hmm. The other thing I have to say is, through the people that they installed, the the fail, the, the, the Haitian state has completely been um, disbanded. So Martelly did not run elections, municipal and regional elections. Um, um, uh, Jovenel Moise, the successor that was assassinated, also did not run elections. And then Ariel Henry did not run, uh, run elections. So by the fall of 2023, every single political office 7,500 political, they have all run out. We have absolutely no elected officials in Haiti right now. And that's wow. by design, because I do want people to understand this. We ask, well, why is this happening? Haiti is the laboratory. The yes. U.S. can get away with so much because it's so easy for you to go in, occupy Haiti, send military force, because people construct Haitians as savages, right? And so it's people think, oh, yeah, we need to put those people down and so on and so forth. But the U.S. needs 
to control the region. The U.S. is militarizing the region, and I hope yes. people know this. Yes. You know, you just had military exercises with Southcom, the U.S. Southern Command, out of Barbados yes. um, just last month. Um, the U.S. is, as it plans for its war with China, as and it Russia. plans to control, yeah. right, as it plans to control Venezuela and Cuba mm -hmm. and Nicaragua, especially since Nicaragua and Russia are working on a new, uh, a new uh, uh, canal that bypasses the Panama Canal. The U.S. needs to have Haiti. And remember, Haiti is one of the most populous nations in the Caribbean yes. with 12 million people. What they need is they need cheap labor. They need the resources. They need the land. Haiti is one of the few places where people still own their land, yes. unlike a lot of places in the Caribbean. So this is what they want. They want to establish a permanent military presence in Haiti. They've been wanting a military base in Haiti since the 1800s, wow. which is why they ended up in Guantanamo, Cuba, because yes. the Haitian governments kept saying no. But now what they're doing, they're going to use the pretext of this invasion and they're going to have a permanent base to control Venezuela, control Cuba, control Nicaragua, but also have a presence that when they lose the cheap labor from China, mm -hmm. you know, um, people don't know, you know, the, the sweatshops were in Haiti, Canada, Canadian companies are in there. So they see this, they want to basically keep the population impoverished, have access to the population to produce uh, things to have a base, but also Haiti is in the trade wind routes, routes right? So it's waters right easy you go straight there in Haiti's between um it's between Haiti and Cuba there's the 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 windward passage which quickly takes you to the Panama Canal to get to send you out to um the the the, the Pacific Ocean correct now many Caribbean citizens um Dr. Pear believe that France is still the colonial colonial master or the colonizer and you know whenever they talk about Haiti they talk about well you know if Haiti behaves itself then France or France needs to take care of Haiti could you please clarify um that to the Caribbean audience once and for all that even though France was once a colonial master but it no longer is the de facto who is the de facto colonial master of Haiti well, I would say the U.S. is the de facto colonial master of not just Haiti, but of Europe. Of, of, I, mean, yes, yes. I mean, you cannot have French imperialism now without without U.S. imperialism. Even when France was in the in West Africa, mm -hmm. they depended on U.S. Um, carriers to help them get to the African continent. You mm -hmm. cannot have, you know, Europe is to me under U.S. occupation. Uh, if Correct. you think about the way NATO works and, and what Europe is enduring right now based on U.S.'s need to for full spectrum dominance and control of Russia yes. uh, and, and China. So, mm -hmm. it, it, but the thing is, the this idea that, the idea that if Haitian stayed under a colonial master that things would be better yeah. is outrageous. And yeah. for people in the Caribbean to think this way, look at New, New Caledonia in the South Pacific. Look what's, I don't know if you heard about the, the that's still a French colony. Um, um, the it, Martinique, Martinique Waterloo? Well, no, no, in okay. New New Caledonia, where there's all these protests happening in the South Pacific, oh, yeah. oh, where yeah. it's a French colony, where yeah. where um, they're protesting and trying to get independence, and France is trying to fight against that. And so, and then you've got a little bit much. Huh? Yeah, I, I don't think that they think that they that you know Haiti would be better under their colonial masters. I think they still believe that France should be the country to take over and to solve the problems of Haiti, the the current problems of Haiti. And so, I how is it? I don't think they understand that France as an empire has died. It's no longer the Yeah, empire but why would France, yeah, but France is still in our business, right? And, yes. and the thing is, the, the idea that we need a European country um, to come and take care of us is like asking the arsonists to come put out the fire that they put on. They, you know, like, let's just remember, I, I, I find that insulting. I find any Caribbean person who thinks that Europe is coming, uh, Europe is coming to help them um, um, is, 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 is insulting because but, the but, truth but, is- But, but this way, um, Dr. Pear, I think that even in Jamaica, um, with all our problems there, I think people who want the United States, there are lots of United, um, Jamaicans who want the United States to, go to Jamaica and solve the problems that are there, the problems Exactly, of, and of not knowing that... Yeah, go ahead. Right, go ahead. But, but not knowing that the U.S. is part of the problem, Correct. right? I mean, the, the reality is the fact that many Jamaicans don't even have access to their beaches now because of Correct. neoliberal political um, policies that the U.S. forced through the IMF, World Bank, the WTO, all of that is not... So that, to me, is neocolonialism, and that's, you know, the, the, the need to decolonize the mind because the reality is there is no Europe without us. Yeah, uh, uh, France has one of the largest gold deposits with no gold mine. Mm -hmm. the, the Europeans have no resources whatsoever, which is why they plundered 
the planet and genocided all the indigenous people all over the world. Mm -hmm. Europe, the European, if we're going to talk about gangs and security and violence, the biggest gangsters in the world are the Europeans and the Un United States people. Yeah. So we have to be very clear about that. And, I, and it, it saddens me that you still have former, you know, people, black people in particular, who were enslaved for 500 Absolutely. years by these Europeans to think that these Europeans um, who are uh, Europeans were very racist, white supremacists who look down on our people to think that these same people want to have our interests at heart. That that is that is unacceptable. And I think we need to wake up from that. Why do you think CARICOM um, has betrayed Haiti? Because I consider it a real betrayal what um, CARICOM is currently doing, working along with the United States. Now, some people think because the meeting was held in Jamaica, that Jamaica is the one leading out in this CARICOM-led mission into Haiti. But sometimes I really wonder if it's the Barbadian president, Mia Motley, who is actually up for um, the, uh, the UN, UN Secretary. Yeah. Right. And when, if you notice also when she was in the meeting, she was the one you know, silently directing and telling the the sitting president of CARICOM, right, the chairman of CARICOM, what to say, what not to say. Yeah. So I, who is really behind this CARICOM? Do you think that, why do you think, that's the question, why do you think CARICOM has betrayed or sister nation? Well, I, I just remember that the history of CARICOM in Haiti is also a very complex and pro problematic one, right? Mm -hmm. And I think for the longest time, CARICOM did not want to have anything to do with Haiti. Correct. I think the rest of the Caribbean, there's there's anti-Haitianism. We have to be honest about this. Yeah. The anti-Haitianism in the Caribbean um, uh, is very clear. We see that in the way that they treat Haitian asylum seekers in the Bahamas, in yeah. Jamaica, in yeah. Barbados. The, fate, the, the reality is that, for example, even if though Haiti is a newer member of CARICOM, yeah. remember, Haiti did not become a member until about 20-something years ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, and CARICOM is 50 years old. Uh, sometimes people didn't even want Haiti because they were they were concerned about the size of Haiti because yeah. Haiti's more than 50% of CARICOM. Correct. They did not like these black people. And they saw them as they saw them as less than you know they bought into this idea that the Europeans had that the Haitians were savages and go around killing people and 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 they were cannibals mm -hmm. and so we have to be very clear about that and I but the, the, there are two things happening I think there's a demise of the the Caribbean left I think you know after the Grenada revolution um, the counter revolution against Grenada and the and the U.S. attack on Grenada really killed the uh, uh, the the um, the Caribbean left and we haven't really seen a, a, a prominent Caribbean left in a long time and in the meantime what do we have we have a bunch of bureaucrats who are you know trained in uh, through think tanks Western think tanks and NGOs and go to the World Economic Forum and become the darlings of the West that become then the ones that are pushed and put in place and so what you have is it's a bunch of neo-colonial mm -hmm. governments um, that are now ahead of CARICOM that basically do the bidding of the U.S. Because if you are not near a colonial government, how are you allowing the U.S. government to run military exercises out of Barbados? How is Irfan Ali allowing um, the U.S. military planes to just fly over Guyana mm -hmm. and whenever they want? Um, even when you hear the U.S. Southern Command a woman, the, the, the woman in charge, walking around saying basically they need the Caribbean's resources. Yes. Um, and, and how do you allow yourself then to be proxies for whatever war that's coming? Because that's why they're doing these military exercises so that these so that they can. That's why the U.S. is, you know, people are not saying like, well, why is it that the U.S. is wanting Canadian, Jamaican, Bayesian soldiers to go and attack Haiti and not putting their own soldiers on the line because the way the U.S. has worked this is the same way they're working in Ukraine is using proxies right. um, and so it, it, what they're trying to do with Taiwan against China and they're going to and then for us what's the sad part is to have you know to have black what we call black and black crime so you can send these black people to go mercenaries to go kill Haitians and when things fall apart they'll say well you know they're just you know it's just these black people you know, killing each other. It doesn't matter because the world doesn't care about black people killing other black people. You know, and I, to segue, I want you to talk about, um, to extrapolate um, Dr. Pear on what do you think are some of the foreseeable consequences of this occupation? Because sometimes, you know, the Caribbean countries think that, oh, that's in Haiti and the U.S. and the Kenyan forces are in Haiti. But do you think that this will have ripple effects on nearby territories like the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Jamaica, do you think they, if they are successful in the occupation and they get there and they begin what they are going to do there, what possible effects do you think, economic effects, social effects, political consequences will there be in well, the 
Well, first of all, no occupation has given us any freedom. Yes. Every single occupation has been one of brutality mm -hmm. and death and misery for the population. The UN occupation resulted in 40,000, 30,000 dead from cholera that they brought in because they dumped feces in our water yes. that killed all these people and sick in the million. Um, the UN occupation force um, killed hundreds of people. There's sexual exploitation. There's still a whole bunch of hundreds of UN babies that were left because of, as a result of rape by mm -hmm. the UN soldiers. And so this is what occupation has meant for us, um, mm -hmm. for Haiti. So the, the fact that what, what's going to happen is it's going to be a bloodbath, right? Because what's going to happen, they're going to kill a lot of kids. Um, Haiti's population, the majority of Haiti's population is under 23 years old. You're going to go and just call everybody gang members and kill a lot of kids. And it's not going to go over well when these Haitians see these Caribbean people and Kenyans killing them. And this might be a bigger mess than, than you think. Um, um, and I, and you know, and then, so when body bags start going back to Barbados and mm -hmm. Kenya and so on, mm -hmm. it's going to say, well, these Haitian savages, because that's what they're going to say. These Haitian savages killed us. But what's going to happen is just, it's just, it's just going to mar it, politically. It's going to bring the Caribbean into more of a mess because they're they're Correct. doing the dirty job Correct. of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And as U.S. empire falls, they're going to go down with U.S. empire, and they have to actually be very careful about that, you know, and and what that means. And it doesn't mean anything economic for us whatsoever. Correct. If, I, it, if anything, the people making money off of this are going to be the Haitian oligarchs, the people in Haiti, the non-black oligarchs and the U.S. corporations. And then basically what you what the Caribbean is providing is just bodies for, think, for the U.S. Do you think some of the gang violence will spill all over into other Caribbean territories? Well, let's let's be clear. Jamaica has a bigger gang violence than Haiti. Correct. You're correct about that. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, and and violence has been Haitian Haitian uh, homicide rates have been very low. It's only the very past low. two years. Yes. And so yeah. the idea that this is a this is coming uh, and I, so why is it that Jamaica is not getting uh, an, an occupation? Assistance. Assistance. The, the, yeah. the, the yeah. Jamaican, uh, you know, Jamaica has had a state of emergency nonstop, yeah. you know, past two, three years. They've had like months long state of emergency. So why? So if this was about gangs, um, then other places, uh, Mexico would get an intervention because of its cartels, uh, Jamaica, St. Lucia, all these places with major gang, Chicago um, has more gangs than, than, than Haiti has. Than Haiti so, has, yeah. So, I mean, so we have to think, think uh, about this because... I have always told people that Haitians are not known to be violent. Jamaicans no. have been known for years to be a violent people, right? right? And so, uh, <laughs> so the idea that, that, is the, clear, idea that the, the problem is gangs is, is also... People have to remember yes. that the U.S. has been wanting to have a military intervention in Haiti since 2021, when Ariel Henry, I mean, when Jovenel Moïse was assassinated, and they put in a place this puppet government that they wanted to support. And so it was in the fall of 2022 that, mm -hmm. before the so-called gang violence blew up, that they that they wanted this mission. Right. Um, and and that back then people were protesting. People forget that Haitians have been in the streets protesting since 2004, and then again 2018, 2019, and then 2022 because the IMF forced the Haitian government to remove fuel subsidies, yeah, which raised prices by 40 percent overnight. Mm -hmm. This is like in 2022, and people were protesting. And what did um, uh, the public government say, oh, it's gangs doing it. So mm -hmm. this is not about gangs. It's about like, you know, keeping the population down so it can control it. And so that's one thing we have to think about. The, the other thing is the people funding, you know, the, 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 the so-called gang violence is very convenient because it takes everything out of the conversation. The fact that people are protesting U.S. imperialism in Haiti, and they've been protesting the ongoing occupation by the core group. They want to get rid of the core group. They want to get rid of the U.N. office. Mm -hmm. And so that is left out and all of a sudden as if this gang so-called gang violence comes out of nowhere the thing is most of the military haiti does not produce guns mm -hmm. it does not produce ammunition mm -hmm. everybody knows that most of these guns and ammunition come through the ports from florida they, they come from the u.s and they come to the private ports owned by the oligarchs who the the u.n and canada has said that they're the they're the ones behind funding these armed groups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Canada has sanctioned five of these oligarchs, so has the UN, mm -hmm. including the former president that Hillary Clinton installed, Michelle Martelly. They've sanctioned them because they know that they're the ones that arm these young 
These guys, you see them walking around in flip flops and torn up shorts, but they have these two thousand, three thousand um, dollar military equipment in their hand. Where is that coming from? Mm-hmm. And, and so the truth is, you could easily stop it. You stop the ammunition. You stop the violence. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. But the U.S. So the U.S. knows. And what's also fascinating is, like, we used to joke that every time the U.S. wanted to go in front of the U.N. to renew the core group mandate. The gang violence would explode. Yes. It's almost like this, and it's almost <laughs> as if it's planned. A pretext, to create, yeah. Right to yes. to create a pretext, and, and mm-hmm. because it's Haiti, and because people's views about Haiti are so racist, mm-hmm. people are quickly to believe that oh, of course they have gang violence, even though this was not an issue. Correct. Jamaica has bigger gang violence it does. than we do. It so, does. so, so that, so that's the thing. So, one of the things that we have to do, we have to be discerning about U.S. media, and and I think one of the things that's also happened is the demise of the leftist media yes. in the Caribbean in Africa. And as someone who does a lot of work on the African continent, what I realized over the years, over the past twenty years since I've been I'm teaching and researching, mm-hmm. is that you've lost all local media. So when you open a newspaper, um, say in Ghana, for example, most of the stories are coming from CNN, BBC. Voice of America. Mm-hmm. So, so you have to think about how the imperial control of mm-hmm. the narrative mm-hmm. through media, through television, and mm-hmm. so on and so forth actually shapes the way that we see the world. And Correct. I think that's what's happening with Haiti. So we've been conditioned to believe that Haiti's a mess, it's a back- basket case, and so it needs intervention. Correct. And so it's because of gangs, even though you would never know that just a year and a half ago, people were in the streets calling the U.S. to stop meddling in our business. Do you think the gangs in Haiti, what they call gangs, gangs, quote unquote? Yeah, I don't call them gangs. I yes. call them paramilitaries. Right. Do you think that they are revolutionaries? Um, do you think that Cherizier wants to create, to refashion, to remodel a new Haiti as, it's, as it were? Do you think it, that's what their intention is? Or do you think that they're working on the side of the U.S.? I can't tell. You know, the, the reality is that um, there's some people, and I think people are very upset about this. Uh, there's some, you know, uh, there, there's some journalists, a uh, couple of white journalists that are saying that these, this is the revolution. But the truth is revolution needs, you need both theory and praxis. Correct. And, and that group doesn't have either. And, and, um, and, you know, I would be all for a revolution because I do think the only thing that's going to save us is armed revolution. Um, mm-hmm. And, and um, I don't think we're there yet. And, and so I think most of the groups, the truth is Sherry Zay is actually not even the biggest or the most powerful armed yeah, group, it's the other yeah. groups. Mm-hmm. Um, listen to this, it's like, remember when that white missionary was killed? It was one of the so-called gang members that actually helped the U.S. government get, retrieve the body from the neighborhood. Wow. They contacted him, yes. Incredible. They contacted him, yeah. And so, so that tells you they know where they are. There's one, there's one group that works right near the U.S. Embassy. Um, so we have to, to know know that. And so, so yeah, so rev, I don't think the revolution, maybe the revolution, the, the, once the violence is, gets um, bad and people will become revolutionaries, um, but I don't see that yet, right? I see right now what people know, what the Haitian people say is like, all they see is violence, right? The people that have been pushed out of their homes. And so, and they're blaming Cherie's, yeah. And so what do you do with that? How do you manage this idea that a lot of people in the neighborhood see him as evil? Um, and, and, and then a lot of people, you know, and then you have these foreign foreigners saying that he's a revolutionary. My thing is, um, I don't demonize Haitian people yes. because it's so easy to focus on this one gang leader and Correct. demonize. And I said, if we're going to demonize people, we need to also demonize the West. We need to demonize the oligarchs mm-hmm. who are funding and fueling this fire. And you notice all of a sudden the airport is open. Correct. The Kenyans are not here yet, but the airport is working. Their commercial flights are back because they can control these groups that they're funding Correct. to wreak havoc. And the U.S. is behind this. And the people I did, de- so I don't demon dehumanize um, Haitians. And I understand these armed groups are causing wreaking havoc, but tell me, Who's wreaking havoc in Haiti? Who's allowing this to happen? It's the right. U.S. government. These are the biggest gangs. To me, the biggest gangs is the U.S., France, and I, Canadian government. I agree. I agree. Now, this is a question that is perhaps um, you might not have a lot of knowledge on, but something that you, I would like you to weigh in on um, We because we're ending now the conversation. Hello? Can you hear me? Are you I still can hear here? you. Yes, okay. I'm still there. Yeah, Jamaica is currently on the road to becoming a republic uh, as it transitions from a constitutional monarchy to a you know constitutional republic now what lessons do you think that jamaica can learn from haiti because haiti is already a republic and jamaicans believe that becoming a republic is going to solve all their problems but i tell them it's not going to solve all your problems when you have us so antagonistic towards the caribbean um, nations who are seeking development the united states is anti-development for the region 
Um, so what lessons do you think Jamaica could learn from Haiti? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, there's, it's hard to learn. The, the one thing to know that Haiti is the longest neo-colonial project right. in, mo in the modern world because yes. there's the counter-revolution. We have to understand what's been happening by the Europeans against the Haitians is a counter-revolution of that revolution. And so from the France demanding, um, you know, the indemnity payment to, to, to pay them back for losing their enslaved Africans to the U.S. occupation in 1915 to 1934 mm -hmm. to more occupations to what's coming now. And so what you have to be careful is, mm -hmm. is, is the counter-revolution to that. What's happening is just, you know, what you have is elite capture in these societies. So you can become a republic all you want, yes. but if the NGOs, the international NGOs, which I don't call NGOs, they're they're because they're funded by the U.S. government, that USAID. If you have your country open up to all these NGOs to create the ideological imperative for you to see only to only believe in neoliberal policies, you cannot have. This reminds me of like. You know, in my work on Ghana um, with independence, where uh, and Kwame Nkrumah used to say, seek ye first the political kingdom and all <laughs> else will follow, which <laughs> is not true. Yes. The truth is you should seek control of both the political kingdom and the economic and, <laughs> and the economic and, and the economic proceeds the political because if you exactly have, you know because one of the things that i've noticed uh jamima is that um to sound of a cure when i read the book that um james uh, James, from, James yeah Taylor James produced I mean he talked about the fact that he brought back the economy after the Robert well in the midst of the revolution before when France was not there and they were trying not to rebuild themselves in the mid uh, 1790s that he brought back the economy to where it was in the 1797 before the revolution started which was phenomenal because right. it was the most profitable colony in the Western Hemisphere period, right? Now, so I thought that I knew, uh, Toussaint Louverture understood the importance of the economy. If you have a strong economy, then you're going to have uh, a formidable political and military infrastructure. Right. And so becoming a republic, the way that uh, Jamaica's economics is just, you know, I, I I don't know if you've seen the documentary. Um, Life and Death. It? Life and, life and death. Yeah, life and yeah. death. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, absolutely. And, and that was in the eighties. Things are a lot worse now. Well, it's worse, it's, much worse. It's a lot worse. Did complete. You, did, I don't know if you noticed that. What was when what when um Hillary Clinton was going to Haiti on her way to Haiti in two thousand was it two thousand ten two thousand eleven? That was a time that she was actually taking out our prime minister Bruce Golding right. because uh there was some diplomatic row between Washington and Kingston, and eventually the prime minister had to leave. And right. since that time, Jamaica has been very shy in standing up to the United States. Right. They just go and, ahead with whatever the U.S. says. They do. Right. And this is why, you know, one of the things that the, the West Indian Federation would have worked, I think, you know, what you need is what's happening in West Africa, the Sahel states coming together. Mm -hmm. And so all these different countries in the Caribbean are sitting there as separate countries. If they came together, I think things would be much better for them, right, in terms of like working as a federation, because the reality is as a small country, it cannot but Jamaica's economics is so terrible right now. It, it the is, fact yeah. that the fact that um, you have yeah, so I'm much a... foreign corporate ownership of land. Yes. The fact that people have been displaced from land. Their beaches. Corporations own all the mm -hmm. beaches, but mm -hmm. also the fact that you import so much stuff. Agriculture Correct. is dead. Um, and so I think one of the things that needs to happen is there needs to be an ideological ideological cha ideological change that goes along with the republic you need to actually move away from the neoliberal models where the the west runs you these you know and what's going to need to happen there needs to be a revolution that happens because the truth is you cannot get better if you don't nationalize your 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 enterprises if everything's privatized and owned by foreigners you're going to have a trouble so you can be a republic all you of course they're going to let you be a republic they still control everything else and to, to, you know, to be frank with you, uh, Professor Pear, uh, you talk about you know J Jamaicans and other Caribbean countries, uh, you know, their discrimination against Haitians, but we don't like each other too. The Trinidadians right. don't like the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans don't like this. It's and just everybody. Silly. Yeah, it's a problem. So even Caricom, and even if we had a West in uh, a West uh, a Western Federation, uh, West, Western Federation, right? I don't think that we would also be united because. But see, that's the problem. We have a problem. That's how that's how white supremacy works, right? Divide Correct. and conquer. Divide and that's and how conquer. that's how the West has been able to do it because all these islands should also be should be one. Yes. So here we are. 
because of colonialism and white supremacy, we're in different islands speaking different languages, even though the boats all came from Africa and stopped at different islands and dropped us off. Correct. And then we're fighting each other and then doing the dirty work of empire. Of empire. And that's, you know, so we need a major re-education of our population, our young people, yes. and, and move away. You know, I think that's, you know, we need to do the idea, the hard ideological work to show how horrible empire is, to show that the real gangsters and terrorists are the Western Europeans who started this crazy world that we lived in for 500 years and they've decimated the world and that they're leading us on the brink of extension right now as we see what's going on in the middle east as well as you know in europe and so it's it's, it's a terrible thing and until we realize until we understand our place in this modern world and understand you know the role um the arsonists who are the europeans and the americans to understand that they are arsonists we won't be able to actually put out the fire and, and to put out the fire, we actually need to come together and understand our histories and understand we actually have more in common if we come together against this empire that's trying to destroy the world. You are my hero, Professor um, Pear. I It has been a distinguished privilege of mine to have interviewed you because I've always wanted to do it and I finally got the day. You know, I've, you know, we're back and forth, but finally we got it off. And I want to, I hope that we can also rejoin in terms of if the situation gets you know gets bad or gets worse over there we can have a discussion as to where we are going because the caribbean citizens i think that we need more education in light of the geopolitics in this region thank you so much and i hope to speak with you um offline okay so we'll keep in Wonderful. touch and have Thanks a great so much for evening having me. thank you so you much too. all the best to you bye-bye